Let's start the story here. Okay, well, not here, but you know, here. Under the metal thing. Ernest Shackleton was one of the greatest British explorers ever. He is the red line here, going down to Antarctica. He did it four times, but on the second, he had a weird project. And this is me on an equally perilous journey on this train. I went to Washington DC to see something about Shackleton and turtle soup in the Library of Congress. So Shackleton, he goes down to Antarctica for the Nimrod expedition. This is the Nimrod and has a crazy idea. What if he and his crew made a book about their journey and actually printed it in Antarctica? I got my reader ID and went to the rare book room. They don't let you have tripods in there, it's that special. I got these sock thinnies to hold down the pages, and then I got to see one of the very rare copies of the book they made in Antarctica, Aurora Australis. It is weird and quirky and includes etched pictures of the crew, and it is the first book ever printed in the polar regions. But here's the kicker. The front and back cover used to be boxes for their stuff, and the front cover for this book it held turtle soup. What happened here? Over the past few months, I've kept running into turtle soup over and over again. I was doing a baseball story and ran into the Hoboken Turtle Club, which came together to eat a bunch of turtle soup. I was researching canned soup and found turtle soup direct from sea to kettle. Look at all these old fancy menus. It is turtle soup, turtle soup, turtle soup, and then Gone. Come on, Applebee's. French onion? Let's get a reptile on the menu. What happened here? How did turtle soup go from elite staple to relative rarity? I read books, I read papers, but I also found a story that taught me about food trends, showed me how technology can change the environment, and bear with me, but a story that reminded me of why I like history. Yep, that is turtle soup. So let me explain. Um, this video is largely about the history of turtle soup, but I think this video is kind of clickbait if I don't tell you at least a little bit about what turtle soup tastes like. Fortunately, there is a restaurant in New Orleans that delivers their turtle soup. It's called Commander's Palace. They ship out turtle soup and let you heat it up at home. But unfortunately, their recipe and a lot of recipes, uh, it includes eggs and I'm allergic to eggs. So I can't eat turtle soup for you here today. So I went onto the Patreon and asked for volunteers and ended up sending $400 worth of uh, turtle soup with garlic bread, yeah, uh, around the country. And there it is. Not the first time I've had this soup. I actually had this a lot growing up. My family was quite obsessed with Emerald Lagasse, so Commander's Palace was a frequent uh, trip for us. It's a acidic, like, umami. It reminds me of gumbo for some reason. Um, it looks like most of it is kind of ground up, so I can't just pick out like a huge piece or something. A lot like minestrone. It was very salty. Not a fan of the bread, but a fan of the soup. How did this all happen? How did it begin? You need to know some basics about turtles and about their geography. This is a green sea turtle. These bad boys are giant. They live in the ocean. They can live three quarters of an Eastwood, so it takes a while for them to reach maturity. That's all important because while these turtles have lots of different nesting sites, check out the red dots, they were super populous in the Caribbean and specifically the Mosquito Coast. That's important because in the 1600s, 1700s, the British were fascinated by their imperial adventures in the region and as a consequence, the sea turtles. This is the island of Tortuga, which looks turtly and probably had some turtles. If you think we're overlapping with the Pirates of the Caribbean movie, you are actually not wrong. And on the fourth morning, he roped himself a couple of sea turtles, rushed them together and made a raft. Anyway, I am condensing a lot here, but England basically finds out about green sea turtles through their Caribbean connection and they decide, hey, this is gonna be an amazing food that we can import and bring back to Britain. People think turtle recipes showed up around the 1750s. The first recipe we know of in the art of cookery claims to teach you how to cook in the West Indies way. 
It was hard to cook a turtle. Look at the recipe. Cut its throat or the head off. A normal person couldn't butcher a giant turtle easily. Too much food. And take the turtle out of the water the night before. These things had to be super fresh so that you could eat them. The turtle was hard to get and hard to butcher, but that scarcity actually made it a little more desirable in elite circles. Even though this is the process, Brits loved it and Americans gleefully followed. Remember, even though the Americans rebelled in the 1700s, they were also burdened by a big inferiority complex. They wanted to borrow elite customs from the British, and green sea turtles were an appealing option. When they couldn't get these turtles, they started using any turtle they could find, including snapping turtles. This USGS map shows you that they show up all over the United States. Or they used the diamondback terrapin as a substitute. The soup that my friends ate, as delicious as it is, it's not using the green sea turtles that gave turtle soup its start. The same thing goes for mock turtle soup. It's often a calf's head that is used to substitute for the turtle. It became so famous that you had the Alice in Wonderland song of the mock turtle. Get it now? This is the turtle part, and here is the calf's head. Turtle soup was such a desirable elite thing that people were rabidly making a bunch of knockoffs. I mean, this was a fad like Supreme or something. So what went wrong? Whoa. Whoa. Like some swag. Pamphlets. Okay. We've got a receipt. Information on Commander's Palace. So I picked out everybody's turtle soup over the internet. Uh, it was shipped to them. It's this extravagant thing that is enabled by shipping networks and the technology of the internet. And in a weird way, that connects to the history of turtle soup. In the 1810s, you had the invention of the tin can. The device improved really slowly over the course of the century. You didn't start getting decent tin can openers, for example, until 50 years later. Manufacturing, it was really slow too. But by the 1900s, that's when Campbell's soup was hitting its stride, Heinz was rocking, and canning was getting really good. So you had the intersection of two trends. Turtle soup is this amazing elite thing that is hard to butcher and hard to get and transport. But then you've got cans which make all those things a lot easier. Suddenly, the turtles can be butchered by professionals in the cannery and then easily shipped out to restaurants or individuals. The 1900s did include shipment of big turtles, like this one to the Fulton Fish Market in New York. And you also had some amped up importing of turtles, like this Turtle King, who was importing live turtles, but he also brought in preserved turtles, sun-dried turtles, and non-live products. But cans were a breakthrough. They spawned the rise of a bunch of canneries in places from Key West, Florida to Texas. This map shows the boatload of turtle canneries in Texas. Let me highlight those in red. Look at this chart of sea turtle commerce by pound in Texas. It peaks here, 1890, 583,000 pounds. But remember, these turtles have to be old before they're big enough to be eaten. You can't eat them while they still look like this. Before the rise of these canneries, you had to transport the turtles live to the place where they finally ended up being butchered. Now, you could can them in a central location and ship them out everywhere. This dramatically increased the supply. It also meant there was a lot of overfishing. They stopped being able to find green turtles and they kind of turned into tourist traps. Turtle burgers, anyone? Look at that Texas bar chart again. By 1927, it was at 1,500 pounds, basically nothing. Popular sentiment began to turn too. These pictures and videos coming up, they're, you know, they're kind of weird. The turtle trade was on the wane, despite the tone of this gleeful newsreel. Seems he recognizes a friend. Well, he'll soon be in the soup himself. In 1947, Life magazine published a magazine article about the rare remaining sea turtle slaughterhouses, gloomy reptiles in a steamy room, where even the owner was shaken by the sound of the turtles howling. In the 1980s, trade restrictions really ended turtle soup from green sea turtles. Today, the snapping turtle has protections as well. So that is how turtle soup took over the world and then disappeared. It started as this rarity. Then a big new technology blew up the bubble 
until it had to pop. They're lugged unceremoniously off to the cannery. Now remember, this isn't what our friends ate from Commander's Palace. Far from it. Tonight I dine on turtle soup. There's, of course, going to be Ninja Turtle jokes all throughout this. <laughs> it's got a little of that oaky, sweet kind of flavor, almost caramelly. Garlic, the undercurrent, punches through the sea of turtle. Mm -hmm. If I just had this at a restaurant and all of a sudden they got banned because they're killing turtles, <laughs> I wouldn't be that torn up, I don't think. Like, it's really good, but it's not so good that I would... You know, go up in arms about it. I can't even eat turtle soup, so why do I care about it? You know, I thought Save the Turtles was only about plastic, but some of the roots of the movement were actually in these campaigns to get rid of the green turtle trade. And the fickleness of Western enthusiasm for turtle soup makes me a little more sympathetic to the places where some species continue to be popular, largely in Asia, but also in New Orleans or Philadelphia. But listen, I'm gonna go back to the Library of Congress and those men who just had to bring turtle soup to Antarctica. I think when history is most interesting, it's like visiting a foreign country. Some cultural things like turtle soup are so different that they make you re-examine the things that you covet or prize in your own time. But a key part of visiting a foreign country is also the familiarity. There isn't just a disconnect, but a through line from people here to people somewhere else, or from people now to people then. The front cover could be as strange as turtle soup, but the back cover once held honey. All right, that's it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. Um, obviously, very grateful to the uh, Patreon supporters who tried all that turtle soup out. Uh, thanks for doing that. There's a reaction video up there now. Um, I'm not gonna lie, I really enjoyed going to the Library of Congress. Uh, did some did some Instagram influencing there as well. So, you know, pretty, pretty excited to multitask. Uh, but yeah, if you haven't been here before, this is a personal channel where I post personal videos, history videos, stuff like that. Uh, always looking for future topics and would love to get your perspective on uh, turtle soup and that weird trend that, that happened and kind of went away. All right. Thanks a lot for watching, and hopefully I will see you in the next one. All right. Bye.